Stand up. There you go. You were dreaming. What's your name? I'm Batman. Vampirism has seen a lot of changes with each Elder Scrolls game. In Skyrim, you can transform into a bat monster. In Oblivion, you get some buffs and a weakness to fire. And your face gets even weirder looking, a feat in and of itself for Oblivion. But what sets Morrowind's vampirism apart from the others is that everyone knows you're a vampire, and they all hate you for it. Foul beast away with you! And I don't mean your disposition with people is at zero, so you have to rely more heavily on speechcraft. I mean your persona non grata. Every NPC, with a few exceptions, won't so much as talk to you. Some will even try to attack you. No one offers you their services, you can't buy or sell from merchants, quests are pretty much impossible, and most significantly, no taxis. Silt striders, guild guides, boats, not on your undead life. And that's why, during this run, we'll also be gathering all of the propylon indices, allowing us to travel between the 10 Dunmer strongholds scattered across Vardenfell. Considering there are such significant restrictions to being a vampire, why would you bother in the first place? To roleplay a Molagbal sex cultist? No, no. Marwin's incarnation of vampirism may be punishing, but it's probably also the strongest version of the curse. Excluding Arena and Daggerfall because I've never played those and I don't even know if they have vampirism. Here's what vampirism does to you. Notice there's three different kinds of vampirism. One for each of the main RPG archetypes. Combat, Stealth, and Magic. We're going to be a combat vampire for this run with a focus on blunt weapons. Since we can't do quests, we'll have to employ the backpath strategy, which I recently found out doesn't require you to be level 20. You just need enough health so equipping the jury-rigged Wraith Guard doesn't kill you. We'll talk about that in more detail when the time comes. Because health will still be important, I'm taking Endurance as a favorite ability and the Lady Sign, so we start with 85 Endurance right away. I won't be taking Strength, however, because we'll be maxing that out soon enough anyway. Speed seems like it'd be better. In retrospect, I probably should have taken Agility or Intelligence. It's not a big deal, though. The only skills I feel I need to take are Blunt Weapon, Athletics, Acrobatics, Restoration, and Alchemy. Blunt Weapon, because Quar Vampires get a significant boost to that skill. Athletics and Acrobatics, because I like being fast. Restoration, so we can start with a healing spell. Spell vendors hate us too, by the way, so we can't buy spells. And finally, Alchemy, because we'll have to make most of our potions on our own. The rules for this run will be rather lax. No bugs or glitches, that's a given. But I'm also not going to run around the world collecting a bunch of strong gear. As fun as it can be to have absurdly high stats, it's just not going to be necessary. There are a couple interesting items I want to show off though, so this run won't only be propylon chambers and ash citadels. There'll be some side adventures as well. Oh, also max difficulty so I don't one-shot everything. To become a vampire, you must contract Porphyric Hemophilia from a vampire belonging to the specific clan you want to join. You get this either by fighting the vampire or fiddling with its corpse. That's going to be tough though. I want this entire run to be as a vampire, and finding a Quora vampire will be an obstacle on its own. Fighting it long enough to get infected is something else entirely. Instead, we'll consult the Godhead and request it bestow us with the Quora clan's vampiric blood. Oh no, I've been cursed. Maybe if I wait a few days, it'll go away. Oh no, I vampire now. And look at these stats. Before vampirism, after vampirism. Pretty wild, huh? We also have access to a 10 to 30 point absorb health spell on touch. It only costs 8 magicka and never fails. I won't be relying on it, but it's nice to have as a backup. As you can see, vampires are really strong, especially if you become one immediately. The drawbacks are social. Also, you take 50% more fire damage, can't heal by resting, and the sun hurts you. We'll need to stay indoors between 6 am and 9 pm. We're just so fast. It's great. Traversing Vardenfell might not be so bad. Speaking of traversing Vardenfell, These scrolls of Akarian flight should come in handy. The first step of our journey is much like anyone else's, the city of Balmora. However, this time around, we aren't going to worry at all about getting starter gold, selling stolen alchemy equipment, buying spells, none of that. We're actually going to stop by Revere's shop. Revere isn't too happy to see us. Some NPCs, shopkeepers included, will attack us on sight. Others are a bit more subdued, like Revere. But we need his shit to become our shit, so... You are clumsy, snowman. We don't have any weapons right now, but Chipmunk did lend us Alpha and Omega, so we shouldn't have too much trouble here. Considering Quara vampires get a sizable plus 50 to hand-to-hand, -hand, accuracy is almost an afterthought. I don't have the Strength Effects hand-to-hand -hand damage mod enabled, unfortunately, but I wasn't planning on leaning too heavily on Alpha and Omega anyway. Assaulting Revere gets us 40 bounty, but there are no witnesses to us killing him, so it's not illegal. We'll just pay off this fine before looting his stuff. Having a bounty as a vampire can be dangerous. Guards will be a bit more aggressive than usual. The reason we slaughtered Revere in cold blood is because he's got demon weapons. The weapons themselves are pretty weak, but they come with conjure bound weapon enchantments. 
Since bound weapons are the equivalent to their Daedric counterparts, except the dagger, the bound dagger is stronger, these demon weapons should carry us for a bit. At least until we get a decent blunt weapon. In fact, we'll take that Warhammer Revere's got as well. Because we can't still stride back to Balmora, we'll want to do as much as we can during this first visit. We're going to join the Mages Guild. Yeah, the Mages Guild, as well as House Telvanni, not only tolerate vampires, but will let them join their ranks. You can even do some of their quests. You can't, however, use their services. But you can take supplies from their chest. So we'll take the teleportation scrolls and the magical potions. Next, steal stuff from Nalkaria's shop. Okay, so I guess the start of this run isn't that different after all. She's got a set of master alchemy tools and a grandmaster mortar and pestle, so we're going to take those. We don't need the alembic because the alembic just reduces the effectiveness of bad effects, and we're not going to make any potions with bad effects that we're going to want to use, so who needs it? That just weighs us down. Because we're near the temple, we're going to check in on the vendors in the temple and see what they're carrying. And by that, I mean we're, we're, we're going to go kill them. Ilan Favarin attacks us if we try to talk to him, so we won't get any bounty. Hooray! The problem with scroll vendors is that they have scrolls, and they use them to not die. Selfish, honestly. Of course, we'll take the intervention scrolls, Unduce's unhinging, and the healing scrolls. This isn't amazing loot, but it's better than nothing. And there's no reason not to check what he's got. Who knows, any of these vendors could have some of the rare scrolls, like Akash's unhinging, or Scroll of Windform. Those would be nice. This guy didn't have them. He sucks. We'll do some window shopping with the alchemy vendors in the basement, too. And what about this guy? Normally a lot of these items would be part of their restocking supply, but they can't restock stuff unless they sell the stuff to me first. And this guy won't sell anything to me because I'm a vampire, and also because he's dead. We might also need some lockpicks. In Hollow Manor, Nolano Dorvane sells master lockpicks and probes, but do I really need to belabor this point much more? Dive! Next, the Chronicles of Nichuleft. That's right. We'll be doing Edwina Albert's quest to get our hands on amulets of Almsivi and Divine Intervention. Invaluable for this run since we can't buy the spells themselves or the scrolls of the spells. The only way to get the book, in Balmora, is by killing Dorisa Darvel. But we don't want to do that deed in front of the guard. Like I said, guards are a bit aggressive towards vampires. You can typically just strike up a conversation with them, and in return they'll try to strike up... you. I guess I'll take the bone mold for now. Not much else worth wearing anyway. We'll kill Dorisa with our vampiric magic. And upon her corpse is a single book, The Chronicles of Nichuleft. There are other places where you could get the book, like in Nichuleft or in Vivac, but this is just the easiest one to get. With all that stuff out of the way, and I'm sure I forgot something, let's go to our first Dunmer stronghold, Chlormarin, just west of Balmora. The index for Chlormarin isn't in Chlormarin, unfortunately but the index for Andus Reth is here, so that's what we'll be looking for. These strongholds were once used as defensive settlements during the wars between the Dunmer, or maybe they were Chimer at the time, and the Nords, but they've fallen into disuse with the rise of the Tribunal. That said, it doesn't mean they're abandoned, and you're likely to find a whole slew of aggressive NPCs in these places. Bandits, slavers, undead monstrosities granted new life by the cosmic heart of a slain god, the usual suspects. Flamarin just has bandits. Your bones will they're a bit jumpy. I think this orc has an orcish warhammer, actually. Yep, already a pretty good upgrade. In fact, I probably won't need to use these demon weapons. I'll still hold on to the spear one, though. Could be useful. There are several levels to these strongholds, and you could just levitate up to the top, but it's more fun to fight your way up. At the top of Flormiron is a dome with a couple slaves inside and the Andus Wrath Index sitting on the shelf. It's considered an owned object, however. Now, it's not that I have an issue with stealing, but if you try to pay off a bounty with stolen goods on you, they'll be confiscated. And I'd rather not have one of my indices taken away. I think killing the NPC that owns the object nullifies their ownership. And I believe it's this dark elf woman, Bronosu Laris, just outside the dome who lays claim to the Index. So if we kill her, we should be safe. She's a bit tough though, wielding a dwarven halberd with a 10 to 20 point shock enchantment on it. We do resist shock though, however just getting hit with the halberd is enough to kill us, so uh, just stay back. Uh. And she's wearing ebony under her robes. I, I didn't expect that. I'll swap it for my bone mold I guess. A bit heavy though, yeah, I might make some alterations later. Anyway with her dead we can go back into the dome, kill this slave so they don't witness us taking the index. Slaves get mad when you steal from their masters, which, uh, whatever. And then we'll take the index. Normally I'd try freeing slaves, as I happened upon them, but even slaves despise vampires. Couldn't free them even if I wanted to. Don't be too shocked that this character is neutral evil, at best. Now that we have the Andus Wrath Index, we can travel to the Andus Wrath Stronghold from either of its adjacent strongholds, either Barandus or Chlormarin. Andus Wrath is just north of Margon, and that's exactly where we want to go next. We'll 
Whoops, sunlight, right. There are quite a few enemies in Andis Wrath, more than there were in Hormarin, but they're mostly low-level bandits, dark elves primarily, and they don't pose much of a threat to me. The loot here isn't all that notable either. There is a House Redoran quest that sends you to Andis Wrath to collect shields from a bunch of dead Redoran guards, as you can see. But besides that, this place is pretty mundane. Quite a bit of alchemy supplies in the crates though. Scuttle, hound meat, quama eggs, hackle low leaves, all great for fatigue potions. I will need to keep an eye out for ingredients that can make drain personality potions though. Why drain personality? You'll learn why soon enough. Ooh, mystery and intrigue. How fun. <laughs> south of Andesrath is Margon, and south of Margon is Shorinbal, a cave system where we can pick up an amulet of Mark. Similar to intervention spells, there may be Mark and Recall scrolls and potions, but they'll only be available to us in limited amounts. Once I kill the merchant, that's it. These amulets act as unlimited casts of the spells, so the sooner I get them, the less I'll have to worry about conserving my scrolls. You're hardly a match for me. Yeah, it turns out having late mid-game stats at level 1 is pretty damn potent. It's worthwhile to check these crates and barrels for Onduci scrolls, alchemy ingredients, and strangely enough, spoiled slowfall potions. They don't do much, and they drain one of your stats temporarily, but even one point of slowfall negates falling damage, and we'll need that when we decide to use those Ikarian flight scrolls. I also want some Shayan. Fortify endurance and drain intelligence by 10 points each. Why? More mystery, woo. I almost forgot to loot the amulet, that would have been annoying. Next stop, Caldera. I know you may be expecting me to kill Pemini and take her boots at blinding speed, but you'd be wrong. As much as I love zooming around like a cat at 3am, I just have no way to resist the blind effect in its entirety. And since we'll be running around at night for most of this run, even if the screen is darkened just a little bit, it'll be too much. In fact, I don't even know how I'm going to tweak the brightness when I do the edit for this video. See, on my screen, exterior lighting is fine. It's dark, but it's fine. Between Adobe Premiere's encoding, YouTube's compression, and people's varying monitor settings, I honestly have no idea how to balance the brightness of these videos to best satisfy everyone, so I think the best thing I can do is just make it so it satisfies me, because I'm the only- th th that's the only thing I can check. I can't check other people's stuff, so I- I, I should just get a permanent night-eye mod. Die tribe aside, in a perfect world where the boots don't darken the screen, I'd probably use them outside of combat to make traveling faster than swap them for a regular pair of boots when in combat to remove the accuracy penalty. But this is not a perfect world. We've got a couple errands to take care of in Caldera. First, Urgola, the local pawnbroker, has the Hormar and Propylon Index. It's on the windowsill of his shop, but it's hard to steal without being noticed. I'm going to enjoy this! Now that he's dead, let's take the Index, some of his potions, and the Shadow Weave Ring. Chameleon is Sanctuary, 20% for 10 seconds. Could be useful, I don't know. Rings are light, so why not? Also, I'm just now realizing there should definitely be a space or a hyphen between Shadow and Weave. That double W looks awkward. I wonder if any languages have double W's as a common phonogram. I know double letters show up a bit in Welsh, quite a few digraphs at least, but I don't think W is one of them. There are a lot of W's though. Next stop, Varric Germain. Uh -huh, a vampire, go away. Uh -huh. He's got an amulet of recall. And he's also got alchemy supplies in his sacks and crates, but the guard here is in the way, so we gotta get rid of him. If we talk to him, a bit stronger than the merchants we've been assaulting, and stronger than the Balmora guard, but not super dangerous. With the official Master Index plugin installed, you can bring the Propylon Indices to Fulms in the Caldera Mages Guild, and he'll pay you 500 gold for each one. After giving him all 10, he'll reward you with the Master Propylon Index and offer to teleport you to any of the strongholds from the Mages Guild. In a normal playthrough where you can use the guild guides, this is great because it means you have a huge network linked to the Mages Guilds across all of Vardenfell, so you can get to pretty much anywhere from anywhere. Place your mark right in front of Foams, recall to him, and then teleport out to wherever you have to go. And they say Marwyn doesn't have fast travel. It does, you just gotta work for it. If it wasn't clear at this point, I'm slowly working my way up the western coast of Vardenfell, collecting useful things as I go. The next indices are in Margon and Nissus, but Aldron is just a short detour as we move north, so we're gonna go pay Edwina Elbert a visit. She wants the Chronicles of Nichu left, which we've already got, and her next request is to get a potion from Skink in Tree's Shade in Sajith Mora. That's on the other side of Vardenfell, a bit out of the way, so Edwina's gonna have to wait. Before leaving Alduran, let's take a peek at Lethry Vary's shop. You can never know what an enchanter has in stock. Eh, it's not all that interesting. Healing scrolls are nice though. Also gonna pay Sien Sinti up a visit. Haven't been here in a few videos, but don't worry, I'm not gonna kill her. We're just here to see what supplies and potions she's got lying around. Ah, 
Coat of Flowers. You might think I'd be making a levitation potion, Coat of Flowers and Racer Plumes, but you'd be wrong. Paired with Willow Anthers, Coat of Flowers can make Drain Personality Potions. 13 points for 37 seconds. Not quite enough for what I need it for, but we'll find more ingredients to make more potions soon enough. I gotta say, even though vampirism is incredibly limiting, it really frees you up to explore the world more. Since you can't use taxis, you're stuck walking everywhere, and that gives you a better look at things. How many times have you walked from Aldran to Margan? I mean, I doubt there's that much to miss. Ooh, a cave, but there's nothing in it. Still neat though, interesting to see the world from a different angle. In fact, we got the Randus Ancestral Tomb right here. I'm sure the way I said that makes you think there's a special item in here, but actually I just want the bone meal. I can use it to make drain personality potions. Enough potions to drain my personality by 39 points. That should be enough. Oh, I was wondering when you guys would show up. Another use for bone meal, telekinesis potions. I had found some alate hide somewhere, pro probably in a random crate. And with bone meal, we can make a 16 foot telekinesis potion. That's a big potion. Ah, our first level, strength, intelligence, and speed. Why not endurance, I hear you cry. Ah, child, all shall be revealed soon enough. Don't feel so bitter. First thing to do in Margon, check out Huleen's hut. Edwina will ask us to do this at some point, and I think I can cut her off at the proverbial pass. Check in on Huleen's apprentice right now, so we don't have to make another trip in Margon in the future. The imp's here, so that's a good sign. Naked man's here too, and our journal updates when we select the All My Fault dialogue topic. Seems this'll work. Fingers crossed for when we get back to Edwina. But now it's time to do what we came here for. In Margon's temple is a giant rock, and there's also a Dramora you can taunt into attacking you. Killing him is part of the pilgrimage quest for the Tribunal Temple, so you don't have to do this, but I wasn't sure if he'd knock on me for what I'm about to do. You see, somebody donated the Phallus Marian Propylon Index to the temple, and it's just sitting around gathering dust. Normally, you could just buy it from Sal and Ravel, but vampire and whatnot. We'll have to steal it. I'd rather not get caught, so we can drink the Telekinesis Potion, stand in this doorway, and just... Easy peasy. The next index is in Nissus, and we can get there from Margon with an intervention scroll. An interesting and sometimes annoying thing about Nissus is it has both an imperial shrine and a tribunal temple, so if you're in this region of Vardenfell, both scrolls will send you here. You can sometimes intervention hop across Vardenfell by alternating which teleport you use, but Nissus is basically a dead end. Say you're in Tel Vos. Omsivi um, Intervention would take you to Aldrun, which is weird. But if you cast Divine Intervention first, you'll go to Savjith Mora. Omsivi um, from there, and you go to Molagmar. Divine Intervention from Molagmar brings you to Ebenhard. And Omsivi um, from Ebenhard places you in Vivek's Temple Canton. And they say Morrowind doesn't have fast travel. So the Barandas Propylon Index is in Nissus within Arv's Drelin, the old cozy Velothi Tower on the fringes of Nissus. Baladas Demnevani is a Telvani mage, so he doesn't really care if we take his stuff. Can even read his skill books while we're here. Although NPCs typically don't care if we do that, but you just give me the index. There's another index close by ish. But I want to go to Solstheim first and loot the Ring of Raven Eye from the stump behind the Thirsk Mead Hall. It fortifies marksmanship by 20 points, but I don't care about that. It also gives 20 points of Night Eye, and I think that'll be really useful for the remainder of this run. Uh, yeah, it's probably unnecessary, but Solstheim is perfect for this scroll. You don't gotta worry about mountains getting in the way. I don't need any of the other stuff, so I'm just going to leave it. And from here, we can Omsivi back to Nissus. How convenient. Onward to Mel Kashishi. Oh, damn it. The one time I don't randomly save while walking to a pl- Man. Onward to Mel Kashishi. Oh, yeah, I dumped a bunch of armor beforehand. That's probably why I died. I just wanted to move faster, man. So Mel Kashishi is a Daedric Shrine east-northeast of Nissus, where you can find not only a few Daedric arrows, but also a Daedric longbow. If you enter from the topmost entrance and levitate across the platform just over yonder, you'll find a skeleton, a dead skeleton, that is, surrounded by a bunch of loot, including the Fallen Serrano Propylon Index. I'm guessing he levitated up here to get away from the Daedra down below, and perhaps succumb to his wounds. I'll let him keep the bow. Ever since I mentioned there being three different vampire clans, I'm sure you've been champing at the bit to know where our clan is. That I have strung you along this entire time is nothing short of disrespect. How cruel I am to keep you in such a terrible state of suspense. Who are the Quara vampires, you shriek? Well, they're hiding within the Dwemer ruins of Druskashti, not too far from the Urshalaku camp. 
They don't like us though. Simply being a Quora cursed vampire isn't enough to be treated as a member of their clan. Really, it should be a colony of vampires because bats, but whatever, clan. If we talk to Volrina, the leader of the Quora clan, she'll give us an initiation quest of sorts. She wants us to kill the vampire Irarik, who's convinced some mortals around Nissus that he's a god, and they've taken to worshipping him. If we kill him, she'll allow us to officially be a member of the clan, and we'll be able to use their wide assortment of services, like a guy that can repair our armor, or another guy that, like, sells a few alchemy ingredients on every restock. How could I refuse? Back burner for now. I've got other priorities in the area that need my attention. The Valen Varian Propylon Index is actually in Nabani Mesa's possession. You can buy it from her rather cheaply, but only if you're not a vampire. So we'll just steal it. Filthy sweat. Yeah, it'll piss her off, but it's not like we need her to decipher a prophecy or anything. North of the Urshalaku camp, across the water, at the western edge of the Shea Gorad region of Vardenvel, sits the old Velothi Tower of Aldredania, and it's here where we put those drained personality potions to use. It's early in the morning. The sunlight isn't so strong that it'll kill me, but the skeletons just might. Within Aldredania, immediately to our right, is a level 75 locked door. Fortunately, I know where to find the key. Down the ramp, across the water, behind the ghosts, and atop this crate are some lockpicks and a chest key. Not only does this key open a submerged level 80 chest, which contains 1250 gold, a scroll of warrior's blessing, and an acrobatic skill book, but it also opens that door at the front of the tower. The top stairs behind this door is the coziest part of all Velothi towers, but this one's got some skeletons ruined in the place. It might not seem obvious at first blush, but one of these skeletons is actually very dangerous. See? It has a unique enchanted item, the Vampiric Ring. It absorbs 20 to 30 points of fatigue and health for 10 seconds on touch. Pretty strong, but each cast uses up a lot of its charges. It also has a silver staff of war. Might come in handy. 5 to 11 points of fire, frost, and shock damage on touch. Staves attack fast, so we'd be able to proc the enchant several times in quick succession. That's not why I'm here, though. That's just gravy. The main prize is upstairs on the altar. The Bitter Cup. It's part of the Thieves' Guild questline, but if you drink from it, it raises your highest attribute by 20 points and reduces your lowest attribute by 20 points. Permanently. But only to a maximum of 100 and a minimum of 0. By drinking some Shayan, I can boost my endurance to 95 and with the Drain Personality Potions, reduce my personality to 16. The cup takes these changes into account, so with this spread, I can sacrifice my personality for more endurance. Personality is useless for a vampire, so why not do something a bit more useful with it? Funnel it into a different stat. And that's Endurance maxed out. It's showing 105, but that's because of the Lady Birth sign. If I didn't have the sign, I'd go from 60 to 80 Endurance. With the sign, I get 25 more Endurance, so I go up to 105. The sign fortifies Endurance, so you'd think it wouldn't affect health gains upon leveling, but the Lady sign is an exception to the rule. It's funky. Needless to say, our total hit points will increase by 10 every time we level up. That's all you gotta know. The index we'll be getting next is in its own stronghold, Rotheron, southwest of Dagenfell. So the Rotheron Index is held by Rolls Yeneth. He's in a room by himself on the surface level of the Stronghold, so getting it is pretty easy. But down below the Stronghold are not only a bunch of Dark Elf bandits, but a slave fighting pit where they force their prisoners to fight Daedra, and perhaps each other. Not cool, guys. Their leader, I assume, is this mage, because he's got some pretty good loot on him, and he won't stop summoning these friggin' ghosts. <sighs> One of these items is Adu Samsi's ring, a piece of jewelry that can cast divine intervention. There's actually an NPC trapped here that you can give it to. Also, the Ice Blade of the Monarch, a pretty strong two-handed long blade with a powerful enchantment on it. It, along with the ring, is involved in an Imperial cult quest. Valuable to say the least, but vampires don't need money. Oh, and the robes have a weak paralysis spell on them, but whatever. Let's rescue the ring lady. Right, fire bad. I love heavy weapons. It's so fun to shatter kneecaps. I do some see. I'm here to rescue you. I have you. Well, we've got seven indices. Three more to go. One is in Vivek, one is in Telfir, and the last is in one of the remaining strongholds. Telfir is the closest, so that's where we're headed. I'm going to use my last scroll of the Karian Flight to reach the Grazelands, but watch how I negate the falling damage. Teleportation does not conserve momentum, and this is probably the least nonsensical element of Mundus's physics. The cosmology of this world is crazy. 
Anyway, we're now in Sabbath Mora, and that means we can finally get that potion from Skinkin Tree's Shade. Of course, Edwina's still gonna have to wait, because I'm not going back to Aldrin just yet. No, we gotta visit our favorite Telvanni wizard first. Not really a high bar, but he's our favorite nonetheless. The Indoranian Index is on the table in front of Devaith Fear, and in normal circumstances you can ask him about it and he'll just say you're free to take it if you want. The Telvanni are pretty lax about theft and property ownership. Although I guess if you try to steal something from them that they don't want you to steal, they'll cast you into oblivion, or teleport a scamp into your colon. There's also a key on the table. Devaith has a chest puzzle of sorts. Chests contain keys that open other chests that contain other keys. I never bothered with it because you could just open the last chest with a 100 point open spell, but let's give it a whirl. Why not? Away! The penultimate chest, well, lockbox, actually, is this one right here, right back where we started, in Devaith's office. It contains the key to the final chest, and a Daedric Sanctuary amulet. What does it do? Well, with the drained personality mystery no longer mysterious, I think this is a good time to lay the foundation for another mystery. We'll put this amulet to use a bit toward the end of the run. Ooh, what could it be? The final chest is the one near Yegrim Vagarn, containing Volundrum, a surprisingly underwhelming two-handed warhammer. It's just a fancy drummer warhammer, weaker than my orcish one. How disappointing. The Mirandus Index is in the St. Olm's Canton in Vivek. Before we go to Vivek, we're going to bring the Detect Creature Potion back to Edwina and get the Chimmer of Amidium quest, which requires us to go to Vivek and steal a book. This run really has a lot of, while I'm out, do you need me to get anything? Energy. I believe the quickest way to get to Vivek from Aldrun would be running west to Andesrath and taking the Propylon Chambers south to Hlormarin and carrying on from there. Though now that I think about it, I probably should have Propyloned over to Endoranian, Divine Intervention to Sajrath Mora, Om Sivi to Molagmar, Divine to Ebonheart, then Om Sivi to Vivek, like I said earlier. Eh, <sighs> too late now. I don't want to overuse my teleport scrolls anyway. Yeah, that's... That's the excuse. Level three. It's pretty amazing how quickly you learn the layout of this place when you've had to run around it so many times. It's like frequency breeds familiarity or something. Oh. I'm also a moron because I never put together that the Waste Works is named that because it's the middle part of the Cantons. The Waste. I also only recently realized that the Cantons are different sizes. The Foreign Quarter has an extra layer. I don't know how I never noticed. Anyway, the Mirandus Index is in the St. Ohm's Canton in the Temple on the topmost level. It's behind a level five locked door with some rats in the way. And like other indices, it's easy to miss if you aren't looking for it. And while we're in Vivek, we might as well see what the local enchanters have in stock. The Telvani merchant doesn't hate vampires, so we'll need to taunt him into attacking us. I have you. We'll take the scrolls of Uth's Hand of Heaven, of course. We'll need to be a bit more strategic with how we use them, though. There's nothing else too interesting on him. I guess the Frenzy scrolls might come in handy. So I'll take them too. There's Miange in the foreign quarter. He's surprisingly tough. Either he has a lot of health or the shield spell he cast is really strong. Maybe both. And like a bunch of enchanters, he has a bunch of healing and damaging scrolls. Drathus' soul rod is pretty strong. You'd think vampires would have an immunity to poison, being undead and all. Nope, just immune to disease. He's got some healing scrolls on him. A bunch of offensive scrolls, of course, but nothing unique or special. I guess the defensive scrolls could be good to have on hand, but combat usually ends so quickly that I never remember to use the shield and resist spells. I can use his key to check out some of the enchanted items in his wardrobes. Yeah, well, I was hoping for something that could restore fatigue. Ugh. The last thing we'll do in Vivek is finally steal the Chimmer of Amidium from Cyrilanwi. One step closer to getting those amulets. You know, I considered taunting the Archmage into attacking me so I could take his staff and amulet, considering how strong they are, but I figured that'd make the run way too easy. I mean, it's not that hard right now, all things considered. I, I mean, for the most part, these videos aren't like, oh, this is a huge challenge, can we do it? It's mostly just like, hey, I want to play a game that I like and I want to make stupid jokes about it. Let's, let's have some fun. Whatever. I didn't want to get it because the amulet is busted and the staff would be overkill. The final index is in Talisero, which also happens to be the last stronghold with a propylon chamber. The easiest way to get there is by traveling southeast from Mirandus. And the easiest way to get to Mirandus from Vivek is to run northwest to Balmora, use Om Sivi intervention when close enough, then run further west to Hlormarin, from which I can propylon over to Mirandus. In Mirandus, we can cut down a bunch of the weak bandits here. For fun, really. Including this guy wearing armor I don't think I've ever seen before. Oh, it's Imperial Dragon Scale. Hmm. Talisaro is just a short run southeast from Mirandus, and unlike the other strongholds, it contains no bandits. Instead, it's full of sixth house enemies and corpus monsters. It makes me wonder why Kogarun doesn't have a propylon chamber. Is it because it's right next to Phallus Marion? 
and it would be kind of useless, although that doesn't really stop Phallus Marion and Valenvarian from having chambers. They aren't that much further apart from each other. Maybe the chambers were built after the fall of House Dagoth, and since Kogarun was already in Dagoth territory, the builders just skipped it. And maybe Telesero, being so far from Red Mountain, wasn't overrun by House Dagoth until after the chambers were built. There's something like 500 years between the awakening of Dagoth Ur and the events of Morrowind, so it's possible, I guess. This index is probably the most easily missed. You can barely see it if you're looking right at it. Ooh, sixth house bell hammer, stronger warhammer, bigger number means better, right? Replacing my orcish warhammer, a non-normal weapon type, with this occult warhammer used by the servants of an undead god is a sensible decision. Surely the sixth house bell hammer is a non-normal weapon. It should deal with Daedra no problem, right? With the entire Propylon network set up, we can easily travel from one side of Vardenfell to the other with only a few hops between the chambers. How can we use this to get back to Alderaan real quick? You might think we'd go to Andus Wrath and use Omsivia Intervention, but that'd send us to Nissus. Maybe we go to Andus Wrath and run east a little bit and then Omsivia Intervention. Yeah, that would work. That would get us to Aldrin. But here's a faster way. It's pretty counterintuitive. If we go to Fallon Serrano on the opposite side of Red Mountain and use Omsivia Intervention, we'll land in Aldrin. Region boundaries are weird. Before going to the guild, I want to see what the temple has for sale. Ah, Shulk Resin. We'll need this to get Wraithguard. More on that later. Here's another book, Edwina. Thank you, Batman. Oh, <laughs> I forgot I named myself Batman. Now you want me to check on a disturbance in Hulin's hut? Well, won't you be happy to hear that I've already done that? Batman always comes prepared. You, you hear that? I, I, that, that? The bat call. Oh, you're immediately done with a Chimar Vermidium? And you want me to return it? Was the guilt too much? Because the cycle is complete, I had placed a mark in the Telesaro Propylon Chamber before returning to Aldrun. This way I can jump between intervention regions and travel between cities almost as fast as I could if I had taxi access. Taxes. From Mirandus, we can run south a short distance and cast Divine Intervention to land in Pelagiad. From there, we can cast Omsivia Intervention to land in Vivek. As a vampire, Serilanwi will actually give you a quest to kill someone for her. I believe this quest is involved in getting the Sword Elton brand, but you need to get Gold brand first, and you can't do that as a vampire. So, here's your book back, Serilanwi. I'm not killing the guy for you. We recall back to Talisaro, Propylon to Fallen Serrano, Omsivi to Aldrun, get my amulets as a reward. Thank you, Edwina. Goodbye. Remember the quest the leader of the Quara clan gave us? I don't remember her name, but I do remember who she wants us to kill. Irarok. A vampire hiding out in a tomb outside of Nissus. Getting back to Nissus is trivial now that we have the Propylon network fully online, so let's just get this out of the way. Frankly, I don't think the services the clan offers are really worth it, but it's part of vampirism, so content. Irarok and his congregation are holed up in the Ginneth Ancestral Tomb. When you talk to him, you can either demand money from him to spare his life, or just kill him outright. You could probably also take his money and kill him anyway. The problem is that all of his followers will also attack you, and some of them have fire spells. <laughs> Irarok himself isn't all that strong, but he seems to have a lot of health. As an aside, this was my first hint that the 6th house bell hammer was just a normal weapon. Vampires take 50% less damage from normal weapons. When weapons don't want to work too well, switch to vampiric magic. Fortunately, Irarok doesn't have anything but vampiric touch, so once he's out of magicka, all he can do is punch. His final act of indignation. <sighs> Fastest way back to Drishkashi would be propylining to Phallus Marion and running northwest. These strongholds are surprisingly close to a lot of points of interest. I know I was making a joke earlier, but unlocking the Master Index as a non-vampire is basically fast travel. Vorina. That's what her name was. Having done her quest, she not only allows us to use clan services, but she asks that we bring her some materials in order to craft a special amulet. The amulet can teleport you back to Druskashti, but we need to bring her five extravagant sapphire amulets, among other things. Those amulets are pretty rare, and they're mostly found as random loot, so I'm not gonna bother with it. We can at least barter with Keld and buy some repair hammers. Our first legitimate financial transaction that didn't end up in one of us dying. Mark the date on the calendar, new holiday has been born. Let's go Vivek, to celebrate. There's a level 100 lock on the door to Vivek's chamber, and the only way I can get in there without the key is if I had a scroll of Akash's unhinging, which are very rare, or I had the skeleton key. But to get the skeleton key, I need to open a level 65 door, and I don't think I could do that either. Instead, we can use Onduce's unhinging on the back entrance to the High Fane. It's only a level 50 lock. Even the Arch Cannon isn't immune to perpetual taunts. Die, 
Oh no, with his death, the threads of my shirt have doomed my ensemble. But he's got a key on him. And an ebony staff. It's a neat, blunt weapon, but the benefit of staves is their speed, and I believe their enchanting capacity. Not really their damage output. I don't want it. What we need is the secret palace entrance key. We'll lead with the staff we looted in Algordania. The enchantment on it can do some quick damage. I think it's time we put this Scroll of Warrior's Blessing to use. It heals you up a bit, but it also gives you 60 seconds of Fortify Attack between 10 and 30 points, each point effectively acting like 1% more accuracy. Okay, so one hit kills me. Who'd have thunk? As long as I dodge correctly, I should win this fight eventually. A battle of attrition. Attack a couple times, move 90 degrees to the side, repeat. Keeping my fatigue topped up is tough though. As much as I love heavy two-handed weapons, they drain a lot of fatigue with each swing. That makes each miss more devastating since it's wasted fatigue. And losing the fatigue makes you less accurate, so you miss even more. It's a feedback loop of inaccuracy. Oh no, the fabric of space-time or whatever. Now we're just about ready to beat the game. If you've seen my video of the backpath method of beating Morrowind, then you know what's next. I did make a mistake in that video though, as I've already mentioned. First, you don't need to be level 20. You just need enough health to survive equipping the jury-rigged Wraith Guard. You do, however, need to be level 20 with 50 points of reputation if you want to skip the Ashlander Nerevarine and Hortator parts of the main quest. But that's got nothing to do with the backpath. I got some wires crossed. Second, I didn't have the patch for purists installed back then. That's part of the iHeart Vanilla mod list, but I didn't have it. I thought I did. See, modding OpenMW requires you to tell OpenMW where the mod's files are on your machine. You feed it the file path. I had a folder called Patch for Purists, so the mod appeared in my mod list, but the folder was empty. Whoops. The patch fixes the jury rigging. In the base game, you permanently lose about 220 points of health by equipping the gauntlet. So getting level 20 in that video made sense because I needed all that health. But there's good reason to believe the intention was that you simply take around 220 points of damage. With the patch installed properly this time, I can fortify my health to survive the damage, meaning I don't need a bunch of levels to have enough health. That said, the ingredients for making fortify health potions are kinda scarce. Human flesh, large quama eggs, shulk resin, and vampire dust, ironically. Large quama eggs are easy, the rest are a bit more difficult. You'd think human flesh would be more available when you kill humans, but wait, is human flesh specifically the flesh of men, or is it the flesh of men and myrrh? Because I've never seen elf flesh in the game, any of the games. Is there Khajiit flesh? Argonian flesh? Would orc flesh be its own thing, or would it be myrrh flesh? Huh. The higher my level, the less I'll need to fortify my health. And that's why I'm here at the Dren Plantation collecting alchemy ingredients and cracking skulls. Not only will alchemy levels get me closer to leveling up, but it will also increase the strength of the fortify health potions I make. And it'll reduce the failure rate just by a little bit. Also, a lot of the crops on the plantation are great for making restore fatigue and health potions. It's a win-win. Level 4. I think I got it while killing Vivek, actually, but I forgot her rest. Like I said, large quama eggs are easy. Lormarin to Balmora, and then run to the Shulk egg mine. All the eggs you can loot here are large eggs, so that's trivial. You can also use them to make Restore Fatigue potions. I swear, 90% of the ingredients in this game can make Restore Fatigue potions. I have 5 Shulk resin, a bunch of eggs, and 3 Fortify Health potions that grant a total of 34 extra health. Two I looted from... somewhere. The other one I brewed up myself. Right now, I'd probably need another... 6 18 point fortify potions to maybe have enough health to wear wraith guard fewer if i level up once or twice here's what we'll do visit the four ash vampire citadels two of them have the books we need to bring to jaeger and Bagarn, and the other two contain sunder and keening maybe we'll get a level or two while we're there a lot of skill books in one of those places too end is the first and this is where i realized the sixth house hammer is just a normal weapon i can't touch this dramora vampiric touch it is glad i have magical potions Ash vampires don't resist normal weapons, though. That's weird. They're the least vampire vampires that ever vampired. Not that I'm complaining or anything. Didn't need to kill him, but he was asking for it. Thanks for the book. Veminol is next. No particular reason why. I was just wandering around Red Mountain, on foot, totally not lost or anything, so I could kill stuff for XP. Ugh, another Dramora. Yeah, I'll just go the other way. The sleeper awakes.
That's Sunder. Super strong blunt weapon, but I can't use it without Wraith Guard. Well, I can, but it'd kill me. Citadel number three, Terrainulal. Kagranak's plan book is here, along with a ton of other skill books. It was once a library, so that makes sense. I already got another level. That brings us up to 93 health. I usually don't come into these little side wings of the citadels. Never really saw much of a reason for it, but I want a little bit of extra XP. Well, hot damn. Glad I came up here. I'm here to kick ass and check out a book. And I'm all out of book. But I also need some of your books. Sermon 18, Alchemy. Sermon 7, Block. Sermon 3, Blunt Weapon. Sermon 31, Athletics. Bone Part 2, Medium Armor. And Kagranax Plan Book. Last Citadel, Odrasal. The easiest of the Citadels, if you ask me. The Golden Saint don't know how doors work, so she's not a problem. She'll be she'll be busy for a bit. And Dergoth Odros is just behind this door. The Fire Atronach upstairs could pose a threat, but I can see its shadow through the floor because oops, open MW, lol. As long as it doesn't see me, I should be fine. And here I was worrying about the Atronach. Take the key. Take the key, Ning. Last thing to do is get Wraithguard fixed up and kill Dagother, but I'm close to another level and 10 extra hit points might be useful. I just need to figure out the fastest way to get that level. Hand to hand levels up pretty quick, and I took it as a minor skill for some reason. Every weak punch gets me XP, and the punches are quick, so the level should come in without effort. Oh, it seems I've wandered into Satanine. Good thing too, because I need to buy something from Aral. Shulk Resin. He's got five. I had already used the other pieces I had to make a couple Fortify Health potions earlier. Of course, some of them failed. But with this resin, we can make a few more. Ooh, lucky. Made three successfully. Those are 19 points each. Not bad. I might have enough right now. The damage Wraith Guard does has a range, but I think getting that last level will afford me a little more wiggle room, just in case. I'll just make some random potions for the last little bit of XP I need for alchemy and beat the worm for one more hand-to-hand -hand level. And that's level six. Now it's time to reveal the purpose of the Daedric Sanctuary Amulet. If we equip it, we're whisked away to Magus Volar, a Daedric ruin, or perhaps a realm of oblivion, where we must fight Lord Dragar Volar to the death, or the Dramora equivalent of to the death. It's to my death at the very least. The sixth house bell hammer still can't hurt Daedra, but remember I said I would hold on to that demon spear. I still got it. Okay, my spear level sucks. I'll just use the Silver War Staff. Dramora have innate spell reflection, but the enchantment on this staff is weak enough not to kill me super fast. In fact, I resist one third of the damage completely, and another third I resist by half. And once the charge runs out, I can still beat him with it, albeit very slowly. To rep our vampiric blood, we'll finish him off with vampiric touch. Upon Volar's death, we're dropped back in Telfir with the Dramora Lord's Crescent Blade in our inventory. It's a pretty cool long blade, very Klingon, but it's of no use to us. We only use the amulet as a quick way to get back to the Corpusarium. One time use, by the way. We talk to Jaegerim with the unique Dwemer artifact in our inventory, and it piques his interest. He can activate it if we bring him some of Lord Kagranak's writings, and lo, we just so happen to have them. He won't, however, restore Wraithguard unless we're in perfect health. Even if we fortify our health, he warns, there's no guarantee Wraithguard won't kill us as soon as we equip it. Moment of truth. Seems to have worked. Gotta make sure I heal up though. When fortified health wears off, it subtracts the buff from your current health. Fortunately, all the buffs last for different amounts of time, so I should be able to replenish my health as it's lost. See? It kills you. Whoa. That was close. But I survived. Time to take out Dagoth Ur. Man, Sunder is so friggin' strong. Dagoth Ur welcomes you, Nerevar. Uh -huh. Only the least unhinged people refer to themselves in the third person. So says Batman. What a fool. I'm a god. How can you kill a god? What a grand. Hmm. What are you doing? What are you doing? Fool, stop! Wait, 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 what happened? Did I miss a hit? Excuse me, Mr. Ur. 
This is the end. There we go. The bitter, bitter end. And it was the vampire who saved Morrowind. Batman gets Azura's blessing, while the vampires in Cerado get the axe. Are the Daedric Lords inconsistent? No, it's the mortals who don't understand.